He's just trying to make me feel better, uh, trying to butter you up a little bit with those cobwebs coming out so I don't do such a bad job. But in all serious, all seriousness, this is a grim day in the house of the Lord. <laughs> and yeah, wah, wah, wah. But for real, they scheduled me twice to be here and it got canceled because of snow. Then the third time came last week, Pastor Weaver said, hey, can you still share that message next week? And when you know it, what did they forecast this weekend? Snow. So I, I was joking with Pastor Austin and I said, listen, anytime you guys want to break from church on Sunday night, just schedule me. We'll make sure that we just call it off, all right? But tonight I've been asked to share uh, about healthy marriage. And anybody that knows Kelly and I, you're probably thinking, they asked David and Kelly to share about healthy marriages tonight? No, I'm just teasing. But um, I am David Graham, my wife over there, Kelly. We have four little ones. We moved here to be able to open a Chick-fil-A over on University Avenue. And I was in ministry for 12 years prior to becoming a Chick-fil-A owner. So I have a little bit of experience doing this. And um, you know, they asked me, they said, healthy marriage, David, healthy marriage. And I thought to myself, man, there's so many different ways we could go with this. And immediately all this stuff started flooding my mind about, okay, how do we define that? How do we define healthy marriage? So I thought, you know, what ends up happening a lot of times is that you get this list of what's good and a list of what's bad. And if you think about it, whole libraries Whole industries are dedicated to what constitutes as healthy. Am I right? Billions of dollars are spent on figuring out what's healthy. We don't have that kind of time tonight because I got 27 minutes up there to unpack a whole library of what constitutes as healthy. And we don't have that kind of time to, for me to define that, the whole gamut of healthy marriage. And I've discovered though, Instead, we as people do a really, really good job when we identify something by seeing it. We can tell what we're looking for when we find it. So we're gonna throw up a couple uh, pictures up on the screen and we're gonna have a little contest tonight. And I'm gonna ask you to tell me, is it healthy or unhealthy? Well, what do you think? Let me hear it. Healthy. I say unhealthy. Because if we put the next picture up, that's healthy if you ask me. I can eat that. Cheese all over that broccoli. Yeah, you're right, it's unhealthy. All right, next picture. What do we got? Anybody know what that is? Brussels sprouts. Healthy or unhealthy? Healthy. If you like it the way I like it, you pour maple syrup and put some bacon all over it. That makes it good. Oh, okay, this is a trick question right here. What do you think? Heart healthy, right? No, it's shape of a heart because we love it. I don't know about you, but I love bacon. I just had it for lunch today. I, eat, I try to work bacon in at least once a day into a meal. That's why it's in the shape of a heart, but is it healthy or unhealthy? What do you mean? Isn't that protein? Oh, okay. It's, it's healthy, we get healthy, we get unhealthy. That's a, it's a mixed message, all right? We're, I, won't, I won't be the definitive one on that, I'll let you decide. All right, let's look at the next picture. These guys are saying unhealthy. That's healthy. That's a lot of healthy right there. I could eat maybe one of those things, but not all together, not all at the same time. That's healthy. All right, next picture. Wait a minute. What is that? How'd that get in there? That's when Pastor Austin was Mexican. All right, let's keep going. Oh, what's that? Healthy or unhealthy? Anybody know what you're looking at? This is the, this is the dad bod of Austin Weaver. This is before he, he started to get healthy. And, and we'll look at the next slide. After he had kids, yeah, he worked it off. <laughs> he got healthy again. I had to throw that one in there for Austin. Where are you? Is he in here? Oh, okay. Oh, there he is. All right. So, sorry, Austin. I just had to show the before and after. Man, you did a good job. Doesn't he look good? Give him a round of applause, huh? All right. And this is a, this next one. 
There may be a pri- may or may not be a prize involved. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. What is it? I'm here and unhealthy. Who says healthy? Raise your hand. Why is it healthy? Jesus chicken. chicken. All right, listen. Just because you answered that, you're going to get four free Chick fil A meal cards there, everybody. All right. As we like to say at Chick fil A, those are the Lord's calories. So that's healthy. All right. Moving along. So all joking aside, right? We have so many pictures in our minds of what constitutes healthy. So many lectures, books, studies, tests, sermons, industries, all dedicated to what healthy marriages look like, or just health in general. But instead of trying to keep up with all this, because sometimes I feel like what happens is the comparison trap takes place, And sometimes we get left feeling defeated because we can't keep up with what healthy, what everybody says healthy should be like. Like realistically, I'm really never going to give up bacon. I'm just going to say that right now. I'm going to enjoy what God's made. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is when Jesus told Peter to rise, kill, and eat. It's my favorite, one of my favorite passages. But in Again, God has laid out some principles here, right? For us to make this a lot simpler than what we make it at times. And some principles are simple, but they're not always easy to follow. Am I right? Simple in practice, but not in action. Why? Well, I discovered it requires discipline to remain healthy. It it requires that discipline. Sometimes I might have to say no to my second helping of bacon or my second plate of bacon, I should say, because I don't just get a helping. It usually requires a whole plate. And as much as that hurts to say no to that one more plate of bacon, um, you got to do it sometimes. So my wife and I, we've been married for 17 years, and we just celebrated this last March, 17 years of marriage. And what you see standing before you here didn't happen overnight. I like to say it was really good that we got married when we were young, because I was the best looking I'd ever be at 23 years old, and Kelly probably wouldn't have married me had we met now. I have to work really hard just to keep the ugly off of me, you know what I mean? (laughs) Guys, you understand, when you get a little older, it's not easy. Uh, And I'm just gonna share something with you here in Luke. And this relates, trust me. And if you want to turn there with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it should be there on the screen. And it said, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So if we're talking about maintaining and building healthy marriages, this is one of the best places to start if you ask me. To follow Jesus, it means to deny yourself. So think about that. Saying no to your fleshly desires. Saying yes to the things of God in order to follow him. Simple, right? See, there's no other or no better place, I should say, in all the world, or no better scenario where this is going to be tested, tried, put into practice, than in marriage. All my married people, can I get an amen? Amen. See, I was naive enough to think when we first got married, it was going to get easier. <laughs> Young people, it gets exponentially harder. And it's not because of that woman sitting right over there. I'm not saying it's because of her. It's usually because of ourselves. It's just not about you any longer. That's why. It's not about yourself. Look at these these words that Jesus uses. He says, verse 23, deny himself. 
Verse 24 says, lose your life for his sake in order to find it. So marriage has a great way of confronting us with this decision. It does. Jesus said it this way, and I want you to look over uh, a couple books back in Matthew chapter 19. And again, we'll have it on the screen for you if you didn't bring your Bibles. But for the, those of you that are taking notes, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 through 6. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So one flesh, did you catch that? One flesh, two becoming one. See, many of us choose marriage, but ne many of us never forgo ourselves to become one with the other. It's more than just an act. Denying ourselves, losing our, li our lives in order to find it. We want to hold on so many times to what we had. We don't want to let go of our way of doing things. We don't want to give up our time, our energy, our resources to something we don't want to do. We don't want to surrender to somebody else because we want what we want. We know what makes us feel good and what we enjoy doing. But isn't this just like our relationship with the Lord? Isn't it? Because guess what? We all know this. It's true that he loves us just as we are. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says it. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because he loves us and died for us, guess what? He loves us too much to allow us to remain just as we are. Romans chapter six, just one more chapter over in verse 12 through 13, he says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should not obey it in its lusts and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So we're not who we once were when we come to Jesus. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17 tells us that. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. We're different. We're called to be different. He loves us as we are, but then something else, another transformation takes place. We become someone different. And guess what? It's no different in our marriages, in our relationships. We're no longer the same person. We're not one any longer individually. We're one with somebody else. That's interesting, isn't it? But we want to live like we're still single so many times, like we once were. And I finally figured it out. I understand why it's so hard to stay skinny. Men, hear me out. Because when you're 17 years old, you have the appetite of a horse, of a team of horses. I used to be able to pound 40 wings on wing night right after practice in school, easily, and still be hungry for a snack when I came home. I used to be able to eat the second helping of bacon. No problem. But something happens where, you know, your body continues to change and you get older, but your mind stays the same. Like how many of you still feel like you're 17 years old or somewhere, you know, in the young years? You still feel that way. You think that way. And then you look in the mirror and you realize I can't eat like that anymore. The bottle of Tums by my bed should tell me that every single night. I still don't get it. I figured it out. We don't need weight loss programs. We just need to realize we're as old as we are. That's it. And I've seen this happen to so many new marriages, right? They end up in two separate lives. And here's what happens. They coexist under one roof. They're not one. They're two individuals. And it may look like it on the outside, but they fail to discipline the exercise of becoming one and preferring one another over themselves. The principle is simple, but the action of it, putting it into practice, requires discipline. To have a healthy marriage requires exercise. It requires exercise. I don't love exercise. 
Don't laugh. I saw some smirks over there. You could probably tell that, right? I don't love exercise, but I love the results that exercise gives me. I love the results of feeling good. I don't always love fixing things around the house or being home when my wife needs me to be home. But I love the results of what happens if I sacrifice my time to show my wife that I love her and willing to give her what she needs. Maybe I had some other plans that night. Oh well, she needs me. I gotta sacrifice some things, forgo what I wanted for what she needs. Ephesians chapter five, everybody turn there with me. In verse 22, chapter 5, verse 22. And we're going to read down to verse 25. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for her. So look at this verse, verse, right? Verse 22. So many times we get hung up on this, on this right here, this first verse. But if you read the whole context here in this passage, it's about submitting to one another is what it is. Wives submit to the husbands, right? Just like she does to the Lord in her relationship with him. In verse 25, husbands giving themselves to their wives just as Jesus gave himself to us. It's about submitting to one another. Discipline, sacrifice, effort, giving, exercise. This is the, the business of becoming one flesh. It's hard work. It's hard work. And so many get this picture in their minds. And this is why I encourage every young person to go to marriage counseling because you talk about a lot of things before the day, the big day comes and you say, I do. And you start figuring out a lot of stuff that this isn't exactly what I pictured in my mind. And you start hearing the picture of the other person, what they had pictured in their mind. And you got a whole lot of talking to do. And I've seen so many times the wedding gets delayed or maybe even canceled altogether because they realized up front, I'm not ready for this. And maybe we're not ready for each other. And that's great. Catch it before it's too late. Because this is what's not talked about so many times. It's talked about the big day. And it's like, we think that's it. That, the climax of that big day, when we say I do, that's it. That's what we're planning for. Really, you're planning for everything else after that. And when you realize that, it begins to become clear. It's not just about a single act of marriage. It, it begins with a verbal commitment when you say I do at the altar, right? But then right after that, the real work begins. The real work. Uh, look down in verse 28 of Ephesians chapter 5. Just skip down there. And it says right here through verse 31, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There it is repeated again. So in verse 28, when we love our wives, we are loving ourselves. Just as our own body, right? Verse 29, we're good. Right here it says it. Nobody ever hated his own flesh. We're good at figuring out what we need to be able to take care of our own needs and desires because we know what we want. We're good at that. We're really good at that. And when we begin to learn to do that for one another and we take it another step, miraculously things begin to happen. Striving begins to cease. Arguments begin to diminish. Peace, love begins to enter the home all because we learn to say no to what we want, to our selfishness. Simple principle, but not always simple to execute. 
And lastly, it doesn't just require discipline to get healthy. It requires discipline to maintain healthy. So we get into this state. Sometimes, you know, if you haven't been in shape for a while and you go back, like I'm trying to do right now at Orange Theory Fitness, you realize that you're this close to death because uh, you didn't realize how bad a shape you really were. I can barely walk down these steps because my hamstrings hurt so bad right now. So just be prepared if I fall down. It's like jelly. But you realize the discipline it takes just to get back in shape. But then once you get there and you get that, that basic health, right, and that basic uh, fitness, it requires discipline to maintain it and to maintain healthy. This right here didn't happen overnight. I tell people all the time, I'm in shape. Just happens to be round. <laughs> just one more plate of bacon, right? One more waffle fry slathered in Chick-fil-A sauce and buffalo sauce, please. Oh, I'll have a late night snack. I can't let my wife enjoy those fried pickles with ranch dressing all by herself. That'd be selfish, right? 17 years of this is going to lead you down a dangerous path, trust me. It's called 20 pounds overweight. It's not easy to maintain healthy. And I call this the drift. The drift happens so easily. It, it's so subtle that sometimes it's really undetected because they're not huge compromises. It's not the huge compromises that bring about the destruction of a marriage. It's the accumulation over time that leads to dangerous results, the little compromises. For example, heart disease, type two diabetes, that doesn't happen overnight. They result in years of making poor lifestyle choices. It's not one decision, it's the accumulation of many decisions that lead to this dangerous path. Look at 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 24, read through verse 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. See, to run the race is one thing. Because nowadays, everybody gets a participation medal, right? You just compete, you get the medal. But that's not what this is saying here. We run the race in order to win it. That's another thing altogether. Do you know what I'm saying? To win the race requires something so much more. And sadly, what happens after many years, we find ourselves just main, you know, barely competing. Not even to try to win. We're just happy to maintain the status quo. We become comfortable, right? The li life and the busyness of it. It just so easily consumes us. And it's allowed to take over. I'll just, you know, and I'm not speaking to anybody directly in here, but I just, I know from experience, hey, I'll just take another hunting trip or fishing trip for four weekends in a row without seeing my family. Or, or we're, we're gonna skip church for two months in a row because of basketball tournaments. You know, the reason I say that is because I've seen it, and not from anybody in here, but I've seen it over my 12 years of ministry. It happens, the compromises. And we're not even competing anymore because we just little by little say, it's okay, it's okay, little compromises. I'm not gonna pray with my family tonight. I'm just too tired. We don't need to spend time in the word and, and, and pray together. It's just, it's a late night, we're, we're way too tired. I'm not gonna kiss my wife before work. She knows. What do we need to go on another date night for? I see her every day. She knows. I don't wanna waste the money and she would rather save the money too. Little decisions of compromise. Little decisions that lead to destructive consequences over a longer period of time. And what happens is it takes us out of the race altogether. And so what I've seen is when the kids move out, 
guess what happens? You're left with a stranger in your home and then divorce follows shortly after because there was no relationship maintained or invested in over the years. The disease of the heart happened. The poor decision-making happened. And believe it or not, it happens in ministry too. Song of Solomon puts it this way. He said this in, in Song of Solomon 2.15. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. See, in the daytime, on the outside, everything might look and feel okay, like it's normal, but it's at night when the little foxes come. The little compromises come. They're stealthy. They're undetected. And they feast on what God wants us to be blessed with. They're quiet. And so many times, the things that God meant for us to be able to enjoy together just get gobbled up by the little compromises. See, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be taken out of the race. I don't want to be removed from the race. I want to be a contender for the prize. I want to run in a way that's going to help us win, not just compete. I don't want to miss one day spending time in prayer and the word with the Lord and in prayer and the word with my, my family. I don't want my love to grow cold. I don't want to get it to that place. I don't want to wake up to a stranger next to me one day. I don't know about you. I want to know who my wife is and I want her to know me. I want that love to remain strong and be one as Christ called us to be one, to be his representation of the fullness of his image here on this earth, of his love, of his power. So what's, the question is, what's it going to take for us to get back in the race? What kind of discipline what kind of things like Pastor Weaver shared this morning do we need to say no to and begin to say yes to? I'm going to reiterate that call because the Lord spoke some things to my heart this morning. He said three things. What are they? To say no to and three things to say yes to that God's telling you. It could be as simple as that. That discipline we need to be able to create in our lives, to get back the habits we need to say yes to to put into practice and, and those other things to say no to altogether and stop doing. And I believe that tonight the Lord wants to begin to heal some hearts and be able to maybe mend some broken relationships or some, some relationships maybe that are just, they're strained right now. And a lot of times I've discovered that healing, it can begin with I'm sorry, those two simple words. And, and you could begin to create an atmosphere of openness to get back to where God wants us to be, to catch those little foxes. Good news is, he says we can come boldly to him. Amen? We can bring to him anything, to his throne. And the thing I've discovered is that he can bring healing in an instant. He can begin to do a miraculous work in an instant. And men, hearts, relationships, minds, no matter how bad those circumstances are, we, we just witnessed it this past uh, February in California at our operator seminar. We had an operator share on stage that he was a part of a, a counseling called Wind Shape Marriage. And it's an intensive weekend or week with your spouse. Ones that have called it quits already. And they have no idea why they're even driving in the car to go there in the first place because they said we're done. And this operator shared from the stage that God began to do a miraculous work in both of them. He was already out of the house. They were already living separate lives. And God did something miraculous and began to soften their hearts. And they began that journey, that discipline of being mended once again. God can do crazy, amazing, miraculous things from the deepest, darkest places because his light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And he gives us that strength we need to change some things, to be able to overcome those bad habits or worse. And I'm just going to share with you two more verses. One in John chapter 15. Verse 12 says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. No greater love than in surrendering, as he did for us. And that includes what we may want. And last verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God has a way of miraculously taking those things in our lives that were broken and making them whole again. I love that he can take anything and make them work for good on our behalf if we can trust him with those things. If we can put them back into his hands, he could do that tonight and begin that healing and restoration. Amen? We're just going to pray. Everybody close their eyes, bow their heads. Lord, we were challenged this morning. Or what is it? What is it you want us to say no to? And what is it you want us to say yes to? Lord, tonight we say yes to you. Lord, life happens and it's difficult. And there's circumstances beyond our control. But the thing we can control, Lord, is we can come to you. And we can surrender to you. Lord, you know the hurting hearts. Lord, you know the heaviness that people carry around, even if there's a smile on their faces. Lord, you know the dark places that nobody else sees. Lord, we pray you shine your light there tonight. Lord, I ask for healing. I ask for strength. Lord, I ask for a boldness for couples everywhere in this sanctuary. And those that aren't even represented here tonight, maybe they're watching. Lord, I ask for a strength for them to be able to talk to one another about these things. Be able to confess to one another and begin that healing and mending process, Lord. You desire us to be one, Jesus. You desire us to lay down our lives. And tonight, Lord God, I pray that we would begin that process. Lord, not just in our marriage, but in our relationship with you as individuals. Lord, it starts with us. It starts with us, Lord God. Show us those dark places that you want control of. And Lord, we give them to you. We thank you, Lord God, for your love. We thank you for your mercies. And we thank you for your word, Lord, producing exactly what you desire it to produce every single time. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen.